make my head bigger than it already is. You don't want that. Trust me, you don't want that. Um, this morning, I um, thanked everyone for getting me here, and I'm going to thank everyone again. Greg, Adrian, it's good to see you again. Um, Harry, who I did call and still do call Obi-Wan uh, because he did function that way in my life. Um, and a few others, too. Um, and uh, people often called us an unlikely pair. <laughs> Jan didn't seem to mind. <laughs> Laurel didn't seem to mind. So I think we did good work together. <laughs> she hasn't changed. Oh, okay. um, so it's good to be back. It's good to see so many familiar faces. It's good to see this generation of faces here at, um, oh, I almost said Vanderbilt, at uh, Yale Divinity School. Um, it's okay, because there I almost always say, and you know, we here at Yale, and oh, sorry. So at some point I will make the switch. I'm not sure when. Um, but it's good to be here. It's good to be here and um, do something that I didn't really do much when I was here, which is address the community with some of the things I'm working on and thinking about. So I ask you to join me in this journey of the next several minutes. Some of you will remember this. There's going to be all kinds of roads in life to take. Let's not be afraid to take them. Because we deserve them. We are all good women. Do you know who you are and what you have become? You're the daughters of those old dusty things Nana carries in her tin can. We carry too many scars from the past. Our past owns us. Our daughter's scars, our sister's scars. Thick, hard, ugly scars. So no one can ever pass through to hurt us again. Let's live our lives without living in the folds of old wounds. The film Daughters of the Dust by the African-American filmmaker Julie Dash is stunning in its power and scope. It tells the story of a black sea island or Gullah family preparing to come to the mainland at the turn of the last century. Tradition, change, migration, and bondedness to the land were woven together in the Pazant family. The memories of slavery and working in the indigo plantation of the island are the stuff of history books. They were also written in the hands of the older members of the island and in the stories they tell to younger ones, the games the old and young play, and in the African and Af or Arabic words they continue to teach the children. The history and mythobiography of the film capture my imagination again and again. The words I began my time with you this afternoon come from that movie. They were from the character Eula, who had been raped by a white man. The narrator of the movie, The Unborn Child, is Eula's child. Only the audience knows that the child she carries is truly the one she conceived in love with her husband, Eli. As Eula speaks near the end of the movie, she calls the women to task for ostracizing Yellow Mary, a prostitute who had turned to prostitution after her own experience of rape. Yellow Mary had come home to the island to be with her family again and to heal. Eula reminds them all that the fate and hope of Yellow Mary is their own. No one escapes the ravages of evil. No one stands outside of the promise. 
Then she turns to the younger woman and women, and her words are for us as well. There's going to be all kinds of roads in life to take. Let's not be afraid to take them. We deserve them because we're all good women and good men. Let's live our lives without living in the folds of old wounds. It is in, within this constellation of possibilities that I want to begin to think about the joy we might find in creating just and resilient communities. The notion of all kinds of roads, our willingness or not to take them, the fact that we are, most of us, good people, but we are the children of those old dusty things that Nana carries in her tin can. There are scars, glass ceilings, discriminations built on gender, sexual orientation, weight, beauty, race, age, religiosity, culture. And yes, we do wear some of those scars. For some of us, they are like armor because we have discovered that we do need protection. But what does this do to us ultimately when we live our lives in the folds of old wounds, when we cannot see another way to be except the one we have experienced as being so harmful to us until we mastered it and learned to write its strip, script in our actions. Instead of resilience, I think this calls for a healthy dose of orneriness, colored orneriness. Questions shaped by colored orneriness are not designed to be lullabies that rock us into a deep, sweet sleep. They are questions that ask each of us, you and me, to think through what it means to be responsible and to be willing to take responsibility that can help shape the church guide a ministry, light a pathway to knowledge and wisdom, or not. Colored orneriness is the lived experience of faith. It is embodied in people, and it is found in the concrete context in which people live out their beliefs. It is grounded in the context of struggling for faith and justice. It takes on an antagonistic either or thinking as unhealthy in many places in our faith journey and urges us to live in the both and and of a deep biblical witness. It is an ongoing faith-filled process, a ripening and ripening into wholeness. Living out colored orneriness, integrating faith and life, means that we recognize that we are made in God's image. Indeed, God's very presence is the fabric of our existence, imminent and transcendent, close as our breathing, as far as the edges of the cosmos. And God's love for us is unconditional. But God makes demands, has commands, and perhaps the simplest and hardest of these is that we are called to live our lives out of the possibilities found in wholeness, self-reflection, justice, peace, a new heaven and a new earth, hope, and not our shortcomings that rest on greed, self-centeredness, erevis, hoarding, despair. Oh yes, oh yes, we answer yes to God's what if. This love moves us to grow in compassion, understanding, and acceptance of each other. It is the formation of a divine human community based on love and hope and pointed towards justice. For we are to listen for and hear the word of God and its call for responsibility contemplation in our lives and in the lives of others. And this sets us on the pathway to joy and joy unspeakable. For in the personal search for this kind of spiritual understanding, 
we are also engaged in human struggle where some of us are called to step out and lead. So we must stay mindful that crafting greater spaces of justice and hope involves living our lives with integrity and faithfulness in God. It means coming to a sense of self, finding our identity. For me, colored orneriness is ultimately an attitude that encompasses all of life. So we must take care that we do not spend our lives, our careers, our ministries around a success ethic that is grounded in measurable gains and regrettable losses. Rather, we seek to proclaim the dignity of life. And this can be a challenge as we go about our lives, for it is easy to lose sight of this sometimes. In the midst of budget woes, personal and or professional, challenging students and peers, I mean the ones that appear on the agenda of Student Affairs Committee month after month, the good Lord sends. Dueling faculty and colleagues in all manner of vocations, unyielding, unresponsible co-workers, phones that ring without ceasing, emails and calls and text messages that are never returned. But I suggest that if we think about the call to proclaim the dignity of all people as a strength rather than as a virtue, then we can draw comfort and sustenance from this proclamation because I truly believe that it helps us tap into the ability to continually call forth hope and righteous agency in the midst of those times we are called to guide others on the journey, even as we are uncovering our own. To recognize the precious gift of our isness with all of its realities and potentialities and our ability to be persistent, if not relentless, in pursuing a just world, as well as our ability to fade and relapse into the status quo. When the going gets tough or we realize we have to give up more of our hard-won privileges because we really do have enough when some have nothing at all. You see, the colored orneriness that I am talking about this afternoon comes from the souls of black folk and from a deeply Christian base that brings together the historic force of black folks and even more particularly black women's lives with the demand of the spirit to contextualize and live one's faith. It is reflection on the particularity of one's own faith journey lived and unfolded in community. So, movement one. I hope it's clear that I am not talking about ornery sons, sunglass re readers, the ornery orchard or ornery green or ornery orange or ornery o onion, not ornery amber lager or ornery otter blonde ale, those are beers, or even, even the blue jay of orneriness. I am not talking about the kind of ornery that is easily annoyed or angered. Not the ornery of having an irritable disposition, although some situations may call for it. <laughs> or the ornery of being cantankerous, despite how much I like the sound of that word when engaged in verbal play. No, the ornery I am talking about this afternoon is when folk are difficult to deal with and control. And colored orneriness has been a survival mechanism since enslaved black folk were kidnapped in the name of progress and the Lord and brought to the new world, which was really a very old world for the native peoples living here for centuries. Enslaved black people who were maimed and annihilated in the middle passage and worked like beasts of burden in the peculiar institution and still produced Maria Stewart, David Walker, Jarena Lee, Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, W.E.B. Du Bois, and so many, many more. And the inheritors of these folks are sitting right here, right now, and beyond these doors, and they have allies. Difficult to deal with because we constantly contest and dispute a fiendish status quo that finds its solace and structure in the dehumanization of people based on class 
or ethnicity or gender or race or sexuality, sexual orientation, or just because. Difficult to deal with because sheer orneriness is sometimes the only thing that can keep dreams alive. Give us a creative edge. Help us craft effective strategies for just making social change and helps us keep our humor and sway with our swag. So what we have, so that we have the good sense to celebrate even the smallest victories before we get back to work. And the balance of spirit to know that defeat is an opportunity to learn and grow and craft a better strategy or insight in the future. And not to do it again that way, at least not immediately, if the timing is wrong. Movement two. There is much groaning in this land with a disproportionate moaning coming from queer and non-queer colored ornery folk yearning for justice. Unemployment, education, jobs, health care and health, HIV AIDS, homophobia, heterosexism, environmental racism, poverty, lynching, racism, prisons, sexual violence, prosperity, gospel, tea parties. Yes, there is much groaning in the land that forms the matrix of the cultural production of evil that has become the fabric of life in the US and beyond. If you are too dark skinned, too light skinned, too cisgendered, too lesbian, or gay, or bi, or trans, too inquisitive about the nature of suffering and its particular location, too outraged at the demonic Watusi that we seem far too happy to keep the rhythm to in our lives and in the lives of others. And if we are not careful, we will develop a haute couture of venom and despair that may feel like a faithful response to evil, but is really only driving nails into the coffin of bitterness and brine that is far, far away from the new heaven and new earth that should be the vision that drives us to live a life of joy, that fills our lives and work with vibrant possibilities rather than stultifying realities. You see, I am bone-weary angry at the way black folk continue to be caricatured and stereotyped, and the fact that we are now getting comfortable with doing it to ourselves. And to make matters worse, religious institutions like churches and seminaries are often of little help in calling us into account on this, because these spaces are, are far too often the dressing rooms for this kind of mayhem. They and those of us who participate in them are often far too quiet in our dissent as a rule, preferring oftentimes to create enclaves of holiness, to survive the blight and wait for a time that is ripe for change. On my most cynical days, it feels like I and others are rearranging the deck chairs on our pedagogical and methodological titanics when it comes to dealing with incredibly complex bodies in academia and society that are often fueled by heterosexism, empire racism, imperialism, and homophobia just to begin with. Colored orneriness calls this for what it is, dominant theoethical discourse that is based on a withering ontological panic that morphs into the dull thud of hopelessness. Colored orneriness tells us that we must refuse to perform a heteronormative drag show and resist accepting minstrelsy as rigorous scholarship or engage in a comic skit of learning or a variety act of buffoonish ideas or music and dancing that obscures the breathing heart of deep engagement or research, teaching, advising, preaching, or writing in blackface caricatures that bear little resemblance to thoughtful or wise reflection or faithfulness. If we are looking for joy, we must refuse to rip ourselves apart or invite others to perform this wicked shake dance. Just because the folks who think we are a sea of wanton black hot mess 
are threatening to not sit beside us on a scholarly pew or a suspect pulpit that is little more than a postmodern auction block. In short, I am arguing for us to do our first works over. Rather than live and practice a scholarship or witness that specializes in being the doo-wop pom-pom squad for the cultural production of evil, we must do the work our souls and intellects must have to stop a fantastic hegemonic imagination that has us performing impossible physical and intellectual contortions that not even Cirque du Soleil could do. An imagination that circumscribes love and loving into a narrow and constricting casing that has the nerve to say that this is orthodox when it is really little more than performance anxiety gone wild. The best response I know to such a relentless cartel of evil is the kind of colored orneriness that has an attitude when it is when it's crafting moral thought or strategies and actions that are not terrified of the curve of our hips, the arch of our backs, the slow swing in our walks, the glide of our fingers, the fire in our eyes, the coil in our hair, the deep moans and shouts of our ecstasies, the bottomless welling cries of our sorrow, the slow bend of our smiles, the precision of our minds, the sass of our talk not terrified of our bodies that carry our past and present, our future, perfectly and imperfectly. As the old black women who raised me used to say about such things. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Movement three. But sadly, far too many of us live in a space of paralyzing demons that call us to slip into an endless spiral of horizontal violence. We have neither Martin's dream, Malcolm's nightmare, Walker's color purple, or Mama Day's lightning powder. In many ways, creating greater spaces of justice and hope is a search for a new home that is a place for health, healing, identity formation, resistance, celebration, transformation, and not the place of media-driven images of black living that trick all of us into believing and or living into gross stereotypes of black lives, all lives. A new home in the place where the realities of diversity, difference, disagreement, harmony, hope, justice, all exist. It is a place that shapes the radical differences within our lives, such that we are not forced to conform to a monolithic understanding of community, but instead weave and hew the rock of an eclectic and diverse compendium of communities that are a place of core resistance to demonic oppression. Oh yes, home is a place of rest, a place where we get things done, sometimes alone, but mostly with others. A place that we are still learning to create in a world that features a suffocating regime of galloping iniquities. It is the place of Morrison's dancing mind, Baldwin's mountain, Walker's world in our eye, Sanchez's house of lions, Achebe's Igbo, Wilson's fences, Danticott's crick crack, Aesop's fables, Finney's head off and split. Faithful colored orneriness that is built on liberating justice in a place to gain strength for the journey so that we learn to live creatively in the tight circle of choices that are often given to us in the world we live in, but also plot and scheme and realize ways to craft that tight circle into a spiral of possibilities for this generation and serve as the standing ground for the next generation and the next generation beyond. 
So colored orneriness, and yes, this is another way to talk about womanist thought with its wit and wisdom, holds fast to dreaming a world that is more powerful, more real, more just, more compassionate, a world that shakes with liberating fury and passion as it designs and sets in motion the plot lines of justice and freedom. Because we know that liberating hope is the only defense against innervating despair. This is why we must find and nurture allies, not only to suit our needs, desires, and plans, but those who will challenge and call forth the best from us, who will tell us the plain truth of our acts and how they affect those around us like ripples on a pond or sometimes like tidal waves after the quake to consult only those who look and act and think and are just like us is not gonna change a thing. Colored orneriness calls us to listen for the voices, accept the varieties, allow the voices within our communities, the young and the old, the lesbian and the gay, the propertyed and the propertyless, the heterosexual and the celibate, the dark and the light, the bisexual and the transgender, the male and female, the conservative and the radical, the thoughtful and the clueless. <laughs> All these and more to have a full and authentic and valued place as we sort through how to live our lives outside of the folds of those old wounds. For living our lives outside of those folds of old wounds means that we have to learn how to love ourselves. For this is to love our bodies, and this is sheer joy as we tackle the gross iconization of our lives. Movement four. So rather than looking for happy, I am looking for joy. Happy tells me to see that a more robust future is possible. Joy gives me the fire and insight to refuse to give up on making that future real. Happy gives me a lens into the hope for the world. Joy pulls me, gooses me into not settling for far too little in my life and witness. Joy helps me stretch into the ministry and scholarship that God calls all of us to, to celebrate the spiritual gifts we've been given, to walk around in them, to sit down and play with the holy sand God has given us. Joy refuses to let me live my life in the past tense, the sad what ifs, the dead end maybes, the fruitless and fruitless could be's. Joy dares me to live a deep spirit and spirituality. Joy dares me to live justice. Joy takes us out of the folds of the old wounds that make all of us perform unnatural acts like sexism and transsexism and heterosexism. Joy means creating communities that are bodies of hope and righteousness that spit in the face of the cultural production of evil. A community make of folks like Miss Rosie across the street, Ms. Montez round the corner, Cousin Willie Mae down by the juke house, Mr. Press over at the barbershop, Ms. Gear who ran a beauty parlor out of her home, Mrs. M.O. Sneed Lee who taught generations of children to read, do their plus ones and not kill themselves on the jungle gym, Mr. Butler who taught generations of children to love math and science through rhymes and counting games and took you fishing on Saturday mornings and Ross and Mary Towns who poured all the knowledge they had into their students at North Carolina Central University. Joy that takes like and turns it into love, takes care and turns it into passion takes concern and turns it into commitment. Joy, which takes all the ways that black folk have come to love themselves and each other and remembers that we used to leave people be when it came to whom they loved. 
joy. It's what gets God up doing a standing ovation in creation. Now, it may seem that my invocation of womanist colored orneriness comes from a disembodied nirvana, but I am not arguing for a theme park with gerrymandered thrills and fears. This is not a banal joy that clings to the rim bones of nothingness or a bout of holified indigestion after uncritically woofing down a mess of prosperity gospel or liberal introspection or neo-orthodox dialectics or liberation domination. I am suggesting that it is okay to put some salve on those scars we all carry that does not try to smooth over the folds of our old wounds by manufactured joy or evanescent bliss. And it also does not allow us to live in its hollows. So come to think of it, I am now as old as those old people who helped raise me. Age is a many splendored thing. So regardless of how tough it gets some days, I am encouraged to live my work with joy and to remind myself that I want to be a very old black woman when I die because living of old age is the ultimate colored ornery move. Thank you. <laughs>